Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this session. And my name is Christian. I work at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And this is Nicolas Bock, working at SUSE Linux as a software developer. And today we are going to tell you a little bit about um, our experience on, uh, on running a scientific application on an OpenStack cloud. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the code that we develop, and which is our case uh, study. So uh, and this is not working for some oh. reason. Why is this not updated? Uh, there. Looks better, yeah. <coughs> oh, this is not working. Hmm? Well, it looks like it. No. I don't see. For some reason, it's not working. Maybe it's a different mode. I don't know. Well, this one is, but not the screen up there. Yeah. Oh, oh no, there, there we go. There we go. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. okay. Let's, yeah, yeah. let's see. Yeah. So as a matter of introduction, um, what is um, scientific computing? What do we do when we do scientific computing? Essentially, what we do is to develop, is to, is to write a code, a very specific code, to solve a particular problem. And what we usually do is to try to optimize the code as, as much as possible to be able to uh, essentially to profit from the uh, computational resources that we have available. And that is why, why this is called high performance computation. And essentially, uh, the, the computational resources that we have available uh, is basically a cluster of computer, right? And so scientific computing spans uh, through many different uh, scientific domains. It can vary as widely as going from social science, let's say, to material science, going through a lot of other different domains. And depending on the problem we want to solve and depending on the, on the scientific domain, we will have different uh, computational uh, requirements. One of the uh, scientific disciplines that um, requires a lot of um, computational resources is computational chemistry, and in particular, computational quantum chemistry. And the reason why is because in computational quantum chemistry, we need to solve what is called the electronic structure of a molecular system, uh, which involves operation, um, linear algebra operations, um, with extremely large matrices, uh, which sizes could go up to tens of gigabytes. So that means that uh, we will be often memory bounded by the problem, but also the arithmetic operations that uh, we have to do um, scales really poorly as order n cube, where n is the dimension of the matrix, and it's uh, often related to the system size. And in, in uh, quantum uh, chemistry, the system size is essentially the number of atoms that we have in the system. So again, uh, um, it requires a lot of computational effort. It scales as order n cube, and we are, we are very often memory bounded. So what is the operation, the, the main operation that we do in quantum chemistry? Essentially. What we always can construct uh, from the system is the so-called Hamiltonian matrix. And from the Hamiltonian matrix, we can construct something, another object, that is the density matrix. And the density matrix give us all the electronic properties of the system. With the density matrix, I can ask the system. I can compute any property of the system. So this matrix-to-matrix -matrix transformation is the one, is our bottleneck, essentially that scales as order n q. So what is the technique? What, what, what we are essentially doing? We do something that is called molecular dynamic simulation. 
And what is molecular dynamic simulation? Molecular dynamic simulation is essentially a technique that allows us to follow the position uh, of each and every atom in the system. So basically what we are doing is to track the position of each and every atom um, to be able to compute useful properties. So how this is done? This is done essentially by integrating the Newton equations of motion for the atoms uh, in the system. The atoms are interacting uh, among each other through uh, interatomic forces. If we have the forces, we can essentially update the position of the atoms by integrating the Newton equations of motion. So uh, what do we have? What is the result of doing this? Is essentially that we get a collection of vectors for each and every time step. So we have, a, we have the time step that is discretized uh, the time that is discretized in different steps. So we have the, the vector that, in, that are indicating the position of the atoms for each and every uh, of these uh, time steps. And that is something that we call the trajectory. And again here, we are generating a lot of data. We are generating a lot of um, I.O. And, and writing a lot of things into the disk. So this is uh, another, uh, also another story. Um, so once we have the trajectory of the system, we can compute useful properties such as thermodynamic properties, or also we can uh, uh, see f a particular phenomena that is happening uh, at the level of, of the atoms. Here I'm showing a polymer that is moving uh, due to a heat that is trapped on the system. And uh, here uh, the red and white sticks are water that are solvating this polymer. And we can see that uh, we, we can see that we can essentially track uh, what is happening uh, uh, with this polymer, and this is coming out of the molecular dynamic simulation. So this is this technique has a tremendous uh, um, uh, predictive power and is very important for material science, material discover, discovery. So, but what happens if I want to see? reactions happening in the system. What happens if I want to see what happens if I mix A and B in the reaction pod and let it react? So uh, remember that reactions, chemical reactions, are nothing but formations or new, of new bonds or breaking of those bonds. And um, essentially, essentially, if I want to see reactions happening in the system, I have to go beyond a classical molecular dynamics. And they have to do what we call quantum molecular dynamics. So now we will be solving the electronic structure of the system at each and every time step of the simulation. And again, we will be doing uh, this uh, Hamiltonian to density matrix transformation. So this is a technique that, uh, again, is, uh, uh, requires a lot of computational effort. But the benefit of doing this is that if I can predict reactions happening, in a molecular system, um, this will have a lot of, uh, uh, open up a lot of uh, possibilities in material discovery. So it's very important to be able to predict reactions happening in computational chemistry. So, um, so this diagonalization scales as order n cube, and that means that after certain, certain system size, it's, the calculation is going to be unfeasible. So how do we solve the problem? How, to, how do we go to a very large system? And this um, is an idea that um, uh, another staff from uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory had, and uh, his name is Anders Niklasson, and he came up with this idea of using the underlying connectivity of the molecular system to be able to partition the molecular system into small pieces so that now we can, let's say, distribute it into an um, uh, um, ensemble of computing nodes, for example. So and how, do we, how do we get the connectivity of a molecular system? So um, we can get it from the density matrix, for example, or from the Hamiltonian matrix. Essentially, the density matrix is going to tell us uh, how the atoms are connected in the, in the molecular system. And if we have this density matrix, we can think about the adjacency matrix. And the adjacency matrix uh, 
is a, a mathematical abstraction, a mathematical representation of a graph, right? So if we have this adjacency matrix, we have the graph, and if we have the graph, uh, graph theorists know how to partition this graph into small, into different communities. So now if, if I can partition my system into uh, different communities, now I can construct this Hamiltonian matrix for each and every community. And what I can do is essentially to, um, to send all these communities, all these uh, Hamiltonian matrices, to uh, distribute it, to distribute them to across the, um, all the computing nodes, we can run our, um, um, we can compute the density matrix for each and every node, node and then we, what we can do is to gather everything together to reconstruct the electronic structure of the full system. So that's how we do uh, uh, in order to scale to go to a larger system. So this is a very simple idea and uh, um, which requires almost no communication between the nodes. So when the nodes are computing their own uh, electronic structure, they don't need to interchange any, any data. The only thing that we have is, uh, is a node gather at the end to, to reconstruct the full density matrix of the system. Um, so it's a very interesting technique and um, this is where the idea of being able to allocate uh, computational resources come out because um, uh, if we have a, a, an extremely large system, we would like to have as many nodes as, as, we, as we can to be able to distribute this calculation. So um, again, uh, just to, um, to summarize, the, the, the way we do this is to partition the system into, into very small pieces construct the Hamiltonian for, the, for these pieces, send the Hamiltonian, distribute the Hamiltonian across all the nodes. These nodes will compute these portions of the density matrix and then we will reconstruct everything because we know the connectivity of this full system. So we will reconstruct the electronic structure of, of the full system. Here I'm showing a picture of how this, um, this looks like. So at the left uh, here we have um, here we have a molecule which is a dendrimer. It has a sort of fractal structure. And uh, in computational chemistry, in quantum chemistry, uh, atoms are usually represented by uh, orbitals. And what you, you see here as uh, red dots, those are orbitals that are connected uh, with these uh, black edges. And what happens is that after partitioning, we get these communities. Those are the communities that we use to construct the Hamiltonian, the pieces of the Hamiltonian matrix and send them, distribute them across the node. So here we see a problem that we can run into and is the fact that um, the communities are, are um, usually unbalanced, meaning that we can have uh, large communities and small communities. So here we have to be careful and try to send to distribute um, uh, the communities across the nodes such that all the nodes are more or less the same workload because we don't want nodes sitting there uh, waiting for calculations to arrive. So, um, so here is an example of a system that we usually use and it's, it's called a water box. It's just uh, water molecules in a box. And here you can see one of the partition and this is uh, more than 100,000 atoms. And the problem that we have here is that uh, this system is very large and it takes about one minute to do an, a molecular dynamic time step to, to basically uh, update the coordinates um, of, of the system. So this is a lot. I mean, we, want to, we don't want to wait one minute to update the, the coordinates of the system. Um, uh, so we need to uh, be able to use uh, more for this uh, particular system. We need to be able to use more nodes uh, uh, and so that we can uh, basically lower the time to uh, something less than a second. Because what we want to have is uh, uh, an MD simulation that could be practical, that um, where I could uh, extract useful information out of the MD simulation. We need simulations long enough to be able to see 
phenomena that are happening in the system, right? So we need two things. We need to go um, as large as we can for system sizes, and we need to go uh, as uh, we need to increase the, the time scales that we are able to simulate. Why do we need to go to very uh, large systems? Essentially because, for example, in biophysics, in biophysics we have uh, um, systems that are composed by millions of atoms. And for example, here I'm showing a, a, a full virus. This is the mosaic virus. And uh, um, this has a uh, um, million atoms. And um, it's, it's, it's very useful to uh, be able to do the quantum molecular dynamics simulation of these systems, because there are a lot of interesting questions that, uh, that we, we will be able to, to answer. For example, the possible interactions of drugs with the proteins of the virus, or uh, chemical reactions that could occur at the level of the RNA. Uh, so these chemical reactions could lead to mutations. So there are a lot of questions that could be answered if we are able to push this technique uh, towards uh, many million atoms and, and, and very long time scales. So now I'm going to let you uh, with Nicolas Bock that is going to tell us a little bit more about details of uh, this, uh, the port in this, uh, this uh, code to the club. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, <clears throat> so again, as Christian said, my name is Nicolas Bock. I work for ZUSA. And before this, I worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a computational physicist with Christian in the same group. Um, is it? Oh, it's the wrong direction. There we go. OK, so let me first give you an overview of what HPC Atlanta typically looks like. This is a slide showing you some specs on Trinity. Trinity is the largest HPC cluster at Atlanta right now. It's ranked number 10 in the top 500 as of November last year. It is capable of more than 40 petaflops of performance, has more than 2 petabytes of memory, and more than 19,000 uh, compute nodes. So that's sort of, I mean, that's a very large cluster, but um, that's in the supercomputing centers around the world. Uh, that's a typical sort of setup. From a user's perspective, <clears throat> you run a, a resource manager such as PBS. That's kind of a classic example on a cluster like this that takes care of provisioning resources and also ensuring that the, the cluster itself is um, operating at full capacity all the time. So the, um, the queue, there's a queue that you submit your job to. The queue is not processed in order necessarily. PBS is able to rearrange things there to uh, fill gaps in allocations, for instance. Um, the provisioning is done bare metal in a sense that once you have an allocation, you're able to log into these nodes. They're not re-imaged or anything. So you just get shell access and then log in and run your code there. That means, of course, also that the OS and the software libraries are not something you, you have control over. You have to work within the software environment that these nodes come with. Uh, and then the last thing I want to mention, um, a lot of applications, obviously, if you have more than one node, you have a distributed memory problem. So a lot of applications um, use MPI, the message passing interface library, to um, work with that. I mean, this is essentially a software library that allows you to send data messages in between nodes. So that uh, library, though, um, adds a requirement to our setup that I'll mention in a little bit. Just keep in mind that we have that MPI here that uh, we have to do something about. So then you write a shell script if you want to use this. That's a typical um, example here. Uh, in the first few lines, you instruct this PBS, this resource manager, what kind of resources you're expecting to use. Those are upper bounds. And PBS then uses that to schedule your job. So the tighter these bounds are, the more likely your job is to get started earlier. If there's a resource gap somewhere, I mean like an allocation gap somewhere, then PBS may put your job in there and maybe <clears throat> put a bigger job uh, further back in the queue. So then once you have the allocation, the script is run on the nodes you get. So you then <clears throat> proceed with loading some software modules to set up the uh, you know, library paths and all that, and then run your application in line eight. You submit such a script with this command line down at the bottom. And so overall, this is a very simple and straightforward uh, process. Now, <clears throat> coming into this, not just from a pure user's perspective, 
as an application developer, I mean, Christian and I, we, we wrote the software that we're running there. Uh, there are some drawbacks to this approach um, that add, let's say, some friction to your workflow. The first thing is that uh, typically <coughs> Uh, the OS that's running on the cluster is not the same OS that is running on your laptop. I mean, maybe your laptop runs a different OS, entirely dis different distribution, maybe a different OS. You have uh, probably different libraries and a different tool chain. So your development, though, mostly happens on your laptop. That's more convenient. So if you then go to the cluster and compile your code, sometimes that doesn't work. Right? So this all adds uh, some obstacles to the workflow that you have. The second thing is that when uh, the cluster administrators decide to update some libraries, that sometimes leads to breakage on your end, maybe the API changes of some library. I mean, HDF5 is a good example. <clears throat> At some point, the API completely changed. That forces you to rewrite parts of your code. Um, and then remember always that uh, you know, as computational scientists, you mostly work as a scientist, and then on the side a little bit, you're a software developer. So the quality of the software that you typically write is probably not quite up to the standard that you're used to seeing in, an, in a project like OpenStack. So there's probably you know, less abstractions in there and refactorizations and all that. And then the last thing I want to mention is that although these clusters are very large, they also have large numbers of users. And so typically, the queue is very full. That either means that there's a long wait time before your job starts, or the administrator has to limit the wall time that you have available. But if that happens, that's typically what happens at LANL. Your job has to checkpoint. Otherwise, when you restart, you lose hours of work. And checkpointing is sometimes not so easy to add to code. Like in our case, we use dense linear algebra. We, we just call a library to do that for us. If that library doesn't checkpoint itself, <clears throat> it's almost impossible to add checkpointing yourself unless you change that library somehow. All right, so <clears throat> when I started working for Zusa and uh, with OpenStack, I asked myself the question, isn't there a better way to doing this that um, you know, resolves these drawbacks at the same time you know, and at the same time gives a researcher the same sort of performance? So I mentioned that to Christian. We discussed that, and we decided to just try that out, to actually go ahead and, and try to run our code on an OpenStack cloud. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to tell you how we proceeded doing this. So the first thing we wanted is uh, a custom-made image so that we can control the software environment you know, to make that match what we have on our laptop. So we created a server based on OpenSUSE Leap. And then we put that, oh, what did I do now? Ah, OK. So then we put that on a public cloud. And now, <clears throat> the first time we did this, we realized that within an hour, we got hacked. And <laughs> because we picked a, a weak root password for convenience, you know, we didn't want to bother with SSH keys and everything. <laughs> Obviously, that was a little stupid on our part. But uh, coming from HPC, an HPC environment, particularly at LANL, you work between several firewalls, and security is not a concern there, so we weren't thinking about that at all. So obviously, afterwards, we started securing our service using you know, standard procedures immediately. Uh, then you know, went ahead with creating a normal user, SSH keys for MPI. MPI has to talk internode uh, using SSH. So <clears throat> You need that. Then we installed all the software libraries we needed, built, it, built our code, and then created an image and uploaded that to Glans. So that was actually fairly straightforward after we fixed our security problem. OK, so then to run a job, <clears throat> all that's left to do now is to create a cluster with P servers using that image. Now I want to circle back to this MPI problem I mentioned earlier. MPI, in order to run, has to have a list of IP addresses of all the servers in the cluster. And so, OK, so we don't have that list. We collected um, a list of IP addresses that we got from you know, Nova and uploaded that list into a node, ran, you know, logged into that node, and ran the application. So at this point, everything seems to be solved. Right? It's kind of like the same thing we do on an HPC cluster. It's just much better because we have a custom-made custom image. Well, after using this um, approach a few times, we realized that um, 
there are some rough edges there that, that maybe are not so convenient. So for one, there's this question of resources. <clears throat> now, um, in uh, an OpenStack, a public cloud with OpenStack, you pay by time and by flavor. So what you want to make sure of is that your flavor, the flavor you pick is large enough, obviously, right? Otherwise, your calculation wouldn't run, but that it's not too big. You don't want to overpay for resources. In an HPC system such as Trinity, on the other hand, you typically have so much memory per node that uh, you don't have to be overly careful with how much you know, memory, for instance, you're using. So that forced us, that realization forced us to more carefully profile our application to understand better how much memory we're going to need and then pick an appropriate flavor. There was sort of a, quite a difference to what we're used to. The second thing we realized is that manually creating a cluster with P nodes doesn't scale. You can do this with 10 nodes. At 100 nodes, this becomes kind of tedious, and at 1,000, it's kind of ridiculous. You don't want to you know, create 1,000 servers by hand. And the same, of course, is true for creating this list. You don't want to do that by hand either. OK, so we looked at how can we improve that process, this workflow. And the first thing we did is write a heat template that creates this cluster. The input is, you know, how many, this P, how many nodes we wanted, how many servers. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get heat to also generate this list of IP addresses. So we then ended up writing a second script that we run after the cluster is um, provisioned that asks the OpenStack API directly for all the addresses that we need, compiles a list, and uploads that list into a node, the master node. So that step then, the deployment step, is fully automated that way. And the second thing uh, we wanted to address was the creation of this custom image. Uh, obviously, that's somewhat error prone if you do this by hand. And let's say you want to update the environment in that image for some reason. You don't want to do this over and over again. So we wrote a script that automates this image creation. But obviously, um, there's other, you can do this uh, through many other ways, SUSE Studio, Kiwi, Disk Image Builder, or whatever else you like to use to automate that. OK, so at this point, uh, this, this workflow is just as convenient as using PBS on an HPC system. OK, now let's go over to some performance results. So we ran um, our code with a test system. On, um, we wanted to run it on a, on a public OpenStack cloud, so we picked Rackspace because they're, uh, they're listed on the marketplace OpenStack web page, and also because they're uh, offering ironic resources, because we wanted to make sure, I mean, we, we already assumed that we would have to have some bare metal uh, deployments to get the same performance as on an HPC system. And uh, in com for comparison, we ran this code also on Darwin. Darwin is uh, an experimental HPC cluster at LANL. That was going to be our, or is, is our gold standard HPC performance, so to speak. That's what we expect, or that's what we're used to seeing, and we would like to see in an OpenStack uh, deployment as well. We looked at three flavors that Rackspace offers. Those are all uh, large enough to run our job. This on metal flavor at the bottom is, is an ironic bare metal one. Uh, because our job is mostly compute bound, we paid attention to the CPUs that come with these flavors. I mean, you'll notice that they're different, uh, of course, but their, um, their performance is pretty comparable. So based on these benchmarks there, we wouldn't expect any significant differences in performance simply because the CPU with these flavors uh, is different. So that's good. That means that you know, we can directly compare performance results between these flavors. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. <clears throat> Oh, this is, okay. All right, anyways, okay. So then this is, so now we ran this code for a few MD steps and measured its performance by the number of MD steps per minute that it uh, gets us. So this is kind of like a speed measure of the code. So the first thing I want to point out is um, the results on Darwin. That's our HPC sort of gold standard. That's the line in black. And on top of it, the line in blue, that's the ironic bare metal run uh, on, Rask, on Rackspace. So you see there that the uh, performance and scaling is basically identical. So that's great. That means that um, if we do that, we don't lose any performance moving from HPC to OpenStack. On the other end of the spectrum, let's focus on the line in red. That's um, a general purpose flavor using Nova. 
Uh, obviously, it has a lot less performance. <clears throat> so we weren't uh, too shocked or surprised about this. I mean, that's a general purpose flavor. It's not optimized for workloads like this. So we wouldn't expect the performance of that or with that flavor to be equivalent to something like on metal or um, an HPC system. What surprised us a little bit was the performance of the compute flavor. That's the line in green. Um, that's a flavor that's, that's, that's optimized for CPU intense workloads. But obviously, um, as you see here, the performance is not much better than the general, fl uh, general purpose flavor. So let's look. Um, actually, in fact, let me mention this first. Uh, we went to the one-node case to remove all network communication issues that potentially um, influence this result there. And even there, <clears throat> we see about a factor of two performance difference between the on-metal and the compute flavor. All right, so we wanted to understand better why this, is, why this gap is so big. So we took a closer look at the, um, at the compute flavor that we'll be using. So this is now taken directly from Rackspace, uh, Rackspace's documentation. So this is a flavor optimized for CPU intense workloads. And um, the optimization is that uh, it uses reserved virtual CPUs, meaning that on the host, there is no more vCPUs than physical threads. But <coughs> we uh, found out that the host uses hyper-threading and I don't know if you're familiar with how this works, but in hyper-threading, you have two threads per core. And in, in Linux, often they show up as two logical uh, CPUs. And, um, but the way this is done is that basically only the thread state is duplicated in hardware, and everything else is shared between these two threads. So from a computational point of view, especially for our workload where we use the floating point uh, units most of the time, which are not duplicated, we don't get any performance gain by using two threads on one core. So really what this means for us is that we're mapping eight vCPUs onto four cores. So we really only have half the number of CPUs that we're expecting. And actually, in fact, what comes on top of this is that there are some, some studies that show that hyper-threading for scientific applications because of their particular workload can sometimes be bad for performance. I mean, there's codes that actually run slower if you run them with hyper-threading. Okay, so that um, was kind of interesting. Let's go, okay, Jesus, I keep clicking on the wrong thing, sorry. <laughs> so let's go over to um, our performance results again. Now, this is the same graph I, I've sh I showed you earlier, just uh, slightly differently formatted. What you typically do, I mean, you're not really that excited about how many MD steps per minute you get. What you really want to do is you want to run a simulation for a certain amount of simulation steps to capture an event in, in some system, right, the system you're looking at. So let's say we run it for 2,000 MD steps. I mean, typically you run for a lot longer, but that's just an example, uh, which corresponds to one picosecond simulation time. And this graph shows you the wall time, how, how long do you have to wait for the result to come in. And so, um, as we've seen on the previous slide, the on-metal flavor is by far the fastest than the compute and then the uh, general purpose flavor. Okay, so in a, being on a public cloud, we pay for resources, so we can also tell you how much these calculations cost. So this is um, a graph showing the cost for a one picosecond simulation <clears throat> depending on the flavor. So the nice thing here is, or the, the you know, the big takeaway, I think, is that the on-metal flavor, which is the fastest, is also the cheapest if you measure it like that. So if you're interested in running a one picosecond simulation, you should really go with the on-metal flavor. Interestingly, the, the positions of the compute and general purpose flavors has switched now. I mean, the compute flavor is faster, but also more expensive. And I guess it's more and more expensive than it's faster. So, you know, the, the position of these two lines flipped. Now to put this number, these cost numbers into perspective a little bit, we wanted to um, understand better what you know, the alternative actually running an HPC system on premise looks like. We didn't get, or we couldn't get numbers um, for Trinity or Darwin, so we can't tell you how much these calculations at LANO cost. But we went to, Amazon has this TCO calculator that you can use um, to estimate TCO for on premise. So we used that 
assuming an eight node cluster with an eight core CPU and 32 gigabytes of memory, which corresponds to the on metal flavor. It's the same specs essentially. And Amazon thinks that this costs around $5,000 per node per year. I mean, there's some assumptions in there um, about cost. This is not just the hardware. This is other things like power and networks and blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, um, on rack space, this is how much rack space would charge us for the same kind of compute time. It's between two and a half and six and a half thousand dollars. So <clears throat> but let me make some. Uh, so the first thing we see is that these costs are actually pretty similar. So it's not actually more expensive to move to the cloud. That's, that's good, right? And uh, the second thing I want to mention is that these costs, they depend, a little in the, they depend in, uh, on your situation individually a little bit. Let's say um, you're at a university and you have a shared server room, then your on-premise cost may be much less than this because maybe you can freeload on the power and cooling and the network or whatever in that room. So all you got to do is buy the hardware, right? So this number is probably lower for you in that case. On the other hand, for Rackspace, obviously, if you don't run you know, these simulations nonstop for 20, you know, 24-7, 365, uh, Rackspace would charge you less, right? It charges you only for time you actually use the cluster. So, so uh, you know, basically, you have to individually decide which, which option is the more cost-effective one. But now, in conclusion, <clears throat> I think uh, we've convinced ourselves that the performance um, is equivalent between an HPC uh, system and OpenStack using an ironic bare metal uh, flavor. And it's also a cost competitive option uh, to go to an OpenStack cloud, the public one. So given those two factors, we think that uh, OpenStack can be a very useful alternative, an additional resource for researchers, especially for smaller or medium-sized problems. Um, because it has, um, I mean, there's a lot of public cloud providers out there, so you don't have to wait really to get these resources, unlike on an HPC system. You sometimes have to wait. I mean, you just rent these things and they show up, right? And uh, from a usability point of view, it's actually more convenient to use this because you can define your software environment yourself. You run on a custom-made image. That doesn't change unless you want it to, right? You don't have to update anything in that image if you don't want to. And you can make the image look like the software environment you have on your laptop to make it identical to your development environment. The only thing we found lacking was usability. I mean, initially when we started, <clears throat> It was definitely not as easy to use as something like PBS on an HPC system, but adding a few scripts made the usability essentially the same. So if you gave a researcher scripts like that, uh, it would be just as easy to use for them uh, as PBS is. Okay, so before um, I open the floor for questions, let me just thank the um, awesome SUSE team, and uh, in particular, Johannes Kassler, Robert Warwick, and Bernhard Wiedemann, and Roman Arkea for their support, and our collaborators at Los Alamos, Susan Mizinski, Mark Cockwell, Mike Wall, Enrique Martinez, Tim German, Risto Yejev, and Anders Niklasson. Thank you. Um, did you try, um, uh, when you said that you uh, were running on the um, hyper-threaded yeah. Chips. Did you try cutting the number of uh, threads in half to see if the performance? No, unfortunately, we, we realized that sort of very late. I mean, I, I added that slide on the flight here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, but yeah, that, that's, that definitely would, would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, on the Jetstream cluster, we ran uh, the HPCC benchmark um, suite. And for Linpack, which is a CPU yeah. bound, uh, we ran at 97% uh, of of bare metal. Now the other okay. suite, um, we were somewhere down around 65 to, uh, I mean between 55 and 75 percent uh, okay. performance, because there you're getting into your memory access or networking layers, but that's right, something else. Right, 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 right. Yeah, this is, um, as Christian mentioned already, because of this graph partitioning, the communication component is really small here. So this problem is really mostly compute bound. And so, yes, I mean, obviously for different applications where communication is more relevant, you may see different scaling results. Yeah, we didn't try to overload our core. So even though our system yeah. is hyper-threaded, 
we never ran more than the number of cores right, we actually right, had. Right, right, right. So we had 24 real cores per chip, and we run, even though it was hyper-threaded, we ran 24 um, threads. And like I said, we saw 97%. So we really didn't take the, the hit with the modern hyper-threading like you used to see it um, yeah, 10 right. years ago. Yeah, I think it's way better nowadays. So uh, you, you mentioned that uh, on PBS you, you face job interruption or, or yeah check yeah that's right. So one feature that you didn't really call out here, but is is actually really useful in in OpenStack is that you can if you if you do virtualization you can you can live migrate the instances right. and you can actually persist across maintenance periods. You can persist across mm -hmm. uh, interruptible sessions and everything. So um, you know. There, there is some benefit to doing the virtualization over the bare metal. Mm -hmm. um, you might consider that as well. No, I think that's a very good point, actually. And, and I think that um, one thing we wanted to try, which we didn't really get a chance to, is if you have control over the hardware, you could, um, I mean, you basically turn off you know, hyper-threading and actually try that directly. I mean, we, we suspect that what you're saying is exactly going to happen. I mean, everything I found is that uh, hypervisors like KV, KVM or Xen to have an impact of a few percent at most on the CPU performance. So yes, I totally agree. I think virtualization would add a couple of features that would be great, actually. So you talked about the additional work that was required above PBS for this one application. I'm sort of curious, how much of that would be have to be redone for the next application and the next application after the, that? Or is this basically a one-time cost? This is a one-time cost. Because we didn't do any, I mean, the. Uh, so this heat template is completely uh, um, independent of what this image looks like, for example. Right? All it does is it spawns P servers. And um, of course, that script that collects the IP addresses is the same thing. I mean, it talks to OpenStack API and just gets addresses and populates a file. <clears throat> the only thing that's somewhat specific is the uh, image creation itself. So obviously, if you have a different application in there, you'd have to modify that a little bit. But if you, if you use Kiwi or whatever, you know, some automation uh, method like that, that's not too hard to do. Is that something that you think the average researcher can handle, or is that something somebody like you has to do? Yeah, the, I, well, <laughs> I mean, the average researcher I'm, uh, I know <laughs> probably would be a little overtaxed with that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, so I suppose if you, I mean, I, I suppose you could, if you worked on this a little bit, maybe you can make, uh, you know, UIs or whatever to automate that even further. But, but to write a Kiwi script, I think, is a bit over the head of, of your typical computational scientist. <laughs> Are there any plans to take a look at uh, computationally, uh, not computationally, uh, communications bound or communications balanced uh, workloads yep. in this environment? Yes, that's yeah. We we're, we would like to look at that as well. I mean, like this code is maybe not optimal for this because it's it has I mean built into it very little communication. But we're thinking of using other codes um, like this. This project is also part of a, a, a another MD code called LAMS out of Sandia National Laboratory. Yeah, and so they have a different communication pattern. And one thing we would like to try is run that code on a, on a cloud such as this one and see what the communication impact is. Actually, another thing that would be interesting would be uh, containerization itself That's, you know, as another way of, of creating a cluster you know, through Kubernetes or whatever. That we haven't looked at that at all, but that would certainly be another option. You mentioned that you had a problem with the MPI interface and that you had to build a host file on yeah, the fly. Yeah, yeah. So does this mean that we need some sort of a DNS system for MPI? I, it probably would help. I mean, if you could automate this. So the way this works with PBS is that PBS takes care of this behind the scenes. <clears throat> it allocates your resources and then it generates an environment variable that has this list. And then MPI uh, reads that, right? It, it gets put in the, into that environment. So if uh, Neutron or Nova or some, you know, some component like that would generate that, that would greatly help, actually. Mm -hmm. 
Any more questions? Then, if not, I guess. How many atoms? This was small. We had 1,032 atoms. But we know this was just for expediency. We didn't want to wait forever. <laughs> But typically, runs are much bigger. I mean, what Christian highlighted, if you want to go to a, a more realistic system, you're talking about tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 atoms. Like the largest simulations to date, they're more than a million. Uh, you know, so it's, I mean, bio biological systems are very large on that scale. And to get a realistic simulation, you need to go to large numbers of atoms. Okay. I, uh, yeah, the, the question was what the network fabric is. And um, actually, I don't know. I think the on-metal one has a 10 gigabit per second uh, fabric. I don't know if it's, in, I, I don't think it's infinite band, but uh, maybe it's just a bonded gigabit or something. These other flavors, they have uh, bandwidth caps. They're much lower. But the fabric they're running on, I don't know. It's probably the same, I'm guessing. Yeah. To the actual un underlying transport mechanism? Is that like abstract? Yeah. Run yes. So the question is whether the Open MPI library is um, abstracted above the actual transport layer, right? Basically. And yes, it is. I mean, there's there there there. Uh, you can run on InfiniBand or um, on a normal uh, network interface card. I mean, this is there's many different ways you can operate with this thing. So there's compile time options, basically. That's why it's nice. I mean, it's very, uh, I mean, it's not exactly a very high level abstraction, but um, it's a very, f I mean, it's good enough that it works with any kind of supercomputer, basically, or a cluster at home. Right, if there's no more questions, then I guess I'll close. Thanks. Thank you.